This is the first time that I'm using this format with a large number of people, so I'm hoping that it will be useful for you. And I might uh, probably maybe not have time for questions at the end, so if you do have any questions, just feel free to grab me during the breaks or later on on Twitter. So let's do this. Define a project leader. When you work on a big and possibly lengthy project like a responsive design retrofit, you're gonna need someone who's in charge, reminding everyone to keep on track, who will be available to work on the project throughout the weeks and probably months and who'll be able to keep the momentum and enthusiasm for the project within the team or the company. It should be this person's job and their responsibility to make sure that the project gets done. When you don't have someone like that, it just becomes too easy to start making up excuses why you can't work on the project right now or why you have to delay things. Buy lots of sticky notes. I think you probably know where I'm going with this one. We, at Canonical, we did and we still do all of our planning in a very low-key way. We usually, at least two people, but more often more people, sometimes even the entire team, we get together in a room and we write everything down in post-it notes, anything at all, whatever it is that we're discussing at the time. And that just makes it much easier to then move things around as you change your plan, as you have discussions, or change your requirements and you change your schedule. Involve all the right people. When you're in this planning stage where the project is still getting defined, it's important to get all the right people involved. If someone will get involved later and hasn't participated in these initial discussions, their investment is not going to be the same and it's then much easier for them to question decisions that were made in the beginning. And usually those decisions were made for a good reason. So you should make sure that all members of the team are invited and attend these initial planning and brainstorming meetings, even if they're only going to actually work on the project at later stages. <clears throat> Make a wish list and plan from there. So an easy way to start planning this type of project is to just get everyone to start writing down whatever comes to mind that they'd like to improve on the site. And maybe it doesn't even have to be directly related to making the site responsive, but anything, all the improvements that they can think of. And if something then is not, it's completely not relevant to, to, a, to the project that you're planning, then it'll just be super easy to chuck them, those ones aside for later projects or for the pipeline. And for the rest of the things, you can start by then dividing them by difficulty, for example, or separating them by completion time. And maybe you can also separate the quick wins, like things that you can do to your site that are relatively easy or they're not as time consuming, but that would still be a good step in the right direction. Add deadlines for other projects to the calendar first. So once you started moving forward with the planning of this responsive project, you should take a step back and look at the rest of your schedule. You need to understand very well what the other projects that you need to work on are. So again, write everything, all the projects into post-it notes and then start lining them up chronological, in chronological order and where they should be completed. And you've probably also estimated or at least have a vague idea of how long each one of these other projects will take. So you can start putting these blocks of time in your calendar and start having a good picture of your, of your time. Deprioritize other projects. And here you really need to be ruthless. If there are other projects that don't have hard deadlines or people are stalling or they haven't paid or projects that are just maybe other things that you also want to improve yourself but are not as important as this project, then they should just be deprioritized. 
So following from the previous tip, if you don't have any idea how long a project might take, that probably means that that project isn't set in stone yet, and you're probably missing information to properly plan it. So you can start by moving those to the bottom of the priority pile, or at least move it behind this responsive project that you're planning. And if you don't find it tough to deprioritize some projects, then you're probably not being ruthless enough at this stage. Aim for a date, but be flexible. Basically, you need to have a date to release this first iteration of this thing that you're building, or you're never going to do it. And you should have a little bit of urgency when you're coming up with this date. So don't give yourself too much time for phase one, or you're just going to be dragging your heels. And you can be flexible if and when something unexpected absolutely needs to be done, obviously, but you need to be very strict about this. There should be no amount of shouting that could move that date. It has to be something that is really an emergency, not just something that is urgent. And ideally, you would also book a, a phase two in your calendar. So dividing a project into chunks makes it look less daunting. You can start going through what kinds of things definitely need to be done and just start writing them down again in post-it notes. This is a little bit like tip number four where you created your wish list, but it's thinking in a more structured way about the project because you're going to be thinking about what things need to be done ahead of others. So for, for instance, very traditional chunks would be research, design, development, testing, although I don't think that you're going to be able to plan things quite like this, but who knows, maybe you can. Maybe you need to start by creating a style guide if you don't have one based on your current design. Or, and then after that, you probably will have to update your CSS files and maybe you'll have to do a cleanup of your HTML. So just start listing things the order that you feel they should happen. And then, obviously, you can move them around later if things aren't the way you thought to begin with. And again, post-its are a great way of doing all of this moving around. <clears throat> Prioritize what you want to do first. This is very important. And again, move the list of stuff that you wrote in your wish list in order of importance. I think you will have a good idea of what's a necessity and of what's just a nice to have for your own site better than anyone else. You should allow some discussions with other people within the team or people involved in the project about, about why some things are more important than, than others. And you should also be prepared to lose some of those battles. You just have to make sure that the goal is always to provide a great experience for someone looking at your site on any kind of device. The goal is not to win your fights. Write down everything you will not do. I think this is probably the most important thing that you can do. You don't have the luxury of fixing everything you think that is wrong. So everyone should know what you can't do and what's out of scope. And this should be documented and everyone that is part of this project should know it. In our case, we knew when we did this, we knew that we didn't have time to rewrite the content. So if a page was really long before, the page was going to keep being really long afterwards. We also knew that we were not going to have time to restructure the site, so our navigation was a little bit complicated and it was going to keep being a little bit complicated. And we also knew that we couldn't update the visual direction. So the way that our site looked uh, was not going to, to change. We um, also couldn't change the way that the site looked on large screens when we made this move to responsive. So we knew that regardless of what we're going to do for small screens and for diff reflow, what we had for large screens was going to have to be the same thing before and after. And this list of things was agreed upon very early on in the initial planning discussions, and it didn't change because we just did not have time to fix these things. <clears throat> 
make a page inventory. Make a list of all the pages on, on your site, if that's possible. I think that up to a couple of hundred pages, it's doable. More than that, it's really up to you. And you can also make a list of sections, if that's easier, or you can list all the journeys, or you can even list screens, if that's easier to define for you. And you're going to be using this list to make assumptions on how long things take to be done and the amount of work that you have ahead of you. And it's probably going to be a little bit of a guesstimate on the difficulty of converting each section into responsive. But by doing this assessment and then checking things off as you work through the sections or the pages, the work starts to become more achievable and you start getting the sense of accomplishment and you also get a good overview of the amount of work that needs to be done. <clears throat> Know the transition won't happen overnight. Again, this is to do with setting expectations, but it's something that if people involved aren't very clearly aware of, it will just put a damper on people's mood. If you need to plan a responsive retrofitting in this way, you're probably super busy and your team is super busy and that will never stop just because you want to do this thing. So things will take their time because you also have so many other projects that you have to work on. So that's why it's important to have a date when you're going to get the first iteration completed by. And that date might be a bit away in the hopefully not so distant future, but it will happen. And this is also why it's important to have that project leader that will hopefully keep cheering your team on until the project gets done. <clears throat> Allow plenty of time for device testing. When you're adding blocks of time to your schedule to work on the project and when you're estimating how long it might take you to do device testing, whatever your guess is on how long this is going to take you, you should multiply it by at least three or possibly even five. You really, wanna, you really want this to be working really, really well. That's why you're working on this project in the first place. So you're going to be spending a lot of time, a lot of time, testing your site on real devices and emulators, and that takes so much time if you really want to get things right. <clears throat> test devices, test on devices as you go. Don't just save all the testing to the very end, obviously. The sooner you start looking at your site on real devices, the better, because you won't get too far into the build before you spot big mistakes and big bugs. And also, you should test soon on the tricky devices and tricky browsers because it's easy to just be a little bit afraid of what you're going to get on those, that you start leaving them for tomorrow and then the day after and the day after. And when you realize it, you have only been testing on the really easy ones. So older versions of Android and Opera Mini, for example, don't forget about those. And you might only get a couple of tricky issues that you need to fix, and then you'll just feel better about the whole thing. Get test devices based on analytics. So when working on a responsive site, it's, just, it's not enough to look at prototypes, for example, in Firefox responsive mode. You can use an open device lab if there is one in your area. We're in, we're in a lucky position where there's quite a few around here, but it's much more fun and more practical to get your own set of devices. You can look at your analytics and buy the top three or the top five devices that your visitors are using, depending on your budget, which is what we did we decided not to splash our budget on an iPhone or an iPad because we had plenty of those around the office. So we bought the other ones on our list. And when we started to get some people reporting bugs on the same device or the same operating system and we didn't have that device yet, then we would go and buy it if it wasn't too expensive and slowly expanded our, our set of devices and we also got hand-me-downs from other teams that had devices that they didn't need anymore or from people in our team that they, when they had phones that they didn't want to use anymore. Create a document with initial rules. 
This is one of the earlier steps in our plan. We created a document with some responsive rules. With, then with this document as guidance, the developers took a few days to work through the existing grid and to just add some responsiveness. In this document, we try to follow common patterns, but we also try to be opinionated where we could. And doing this meant that designers could be working on other things, probably other projects completely, and the developers could be moving the project forward. Obviously, this first attempt was a bit crude, and the site looked a little bit off, but once that first trial at adding responsiveness was done, we had something to start testing on emulators and real devices, and it gave us a good idea of the amount of work that we needed to do to get the site into a good responsive state because we could see, we could start to see where the site really, really broke and where it was actually fine. And you can only get that perspective once you start getting your hands dirty and start building things. <clears throat> Make a component inventor, this can be a very quick exercise. You can just go through your site, take screenshots, and put them in folders, and you can start seeing where the variations are, where components can be deleted, or where they should be merged with others that are similar, and you can decide what the rules are based on that. And by doing this in a very simple way, you can also very easily compare the design elements just by looking at them on your screen. We, in our case, we were able to see that we had quite a few different button styles uh, when we thought we only had one or two. And the same with other things like quotes and font sizes. Have a style guide. We did this about a year before we started the responsive project and it was key to the success of the project. We didn't create a new design, we just rationalized our current design patterns and our components and we cleaned up the duplicates, we merged ones that were too similar so that the style was easier to manage. And doing this gave us a really good overview of our site and it helped us to focus on reusing our existing design patterns. And your style guide can be more or less detailed, but it will create a framework that, for the work that you'll be doing. And it also makes it easier for people in the team to communicate about design. Clean up your CSS. This follows on from the previous point. All the decisions that you make about your design and your components and your patterns should obviously be reflected in your CSS. Otherwise, there's no point in, in making them. And each project CSS is going to be very different. In our case, it needed a massive cleanup because it was completely full of duplicates and full of redundancy. It was full of things that looked too similar to other things and they just had to be deleted or had to be merged. So this can be something that can be very time consuming, but it's, it's not something that everyone in the, in the team needs to be working on at the same time. You can have a developer doing this with another one, making sure that things aren't breaking while the first one is changing things. I mean, you're, you'll certainly have ways in your process to make sure that you don't break things too much. And if you don't, that's probably also another thing that you might want to look into as you go through this process. Split your CSS into smaller files, and I would say do this sooner rather than later. This tip is also following from the previous one. If you haven't yet considered this or done this and your CSS file or files is substantial, it's probably something that will make your life easier in the long run. It certainly did ours. So our styles are not used only by us, the web team, but they're also used by other teams across Canonical and even across the, the Ubuntu community. And this dividing of the styles into separate smaller files had been a common request from other people. So we, we use SAS and we used SAS mix-ins to make the framework in a modular way. Uh, so you now uh, have the flexibility of choosing which part of the framework you need to use instead of just getting the entire CSS uh, that you might not need. And we also set global variables for consistency that can be overridden to fit each project's needs. 
make sure you have a solid grid. Sorry, at least make sure you sit down and analyze your grid carefully and think of what the rules are and how it scales up and down for large and small screens and write these rules down. In our initial responsive document, for example, that I mentioned earlier, we stated that our 12 column fixed grid for large screens should scale down to six columns and then down to three columns for the smaller screens. And this really simple rule made it easier for everyone to understand how our designs should scale up and down. Convert your grid to percentages. This was another really useful thing that we did early on. We converted all of the units in our grid to percentages, but we left the site contained within a fixed width container. So to the user, it looked exactly the same before and after we did this change. And it did, took, it did take a little bit of time, but it was a big step in the right direction. And again, it was something that only one person needed to be working on at one time. Evolve instead of change. This is the key idea about not starting from scratch when you don't have that luxury. It's all about reusing what you can. You don't have, to, you don't have time to work on everything that you, you think needs to be fixed, so you have to identify the things that work well in the way that you've done things before and in the way that you work in general. And there's plenty of things you can reuse. In our case, we had a solid brand, we had our Ubuntu font, we had a style guide that we had been working on earlier, for example. And some of the things that you can reuse are not necessarily perfect or not perfect at all, but they work well enough for you not to worry about them in the first stages and just focus on the bigger wins and the things that need more attention and that will make a bigger impact for the users of your site. Don't be afraid to copy. You've got to love ready-made stuff. Existing scripts, existing frameworks, grid generators, design patterns, anything that works for you and that can save you time to work through the trickier problems. So for the first iteration, we structured our documentation in the same way as Bootstrap's documentation, for example. We used the Imager.js script for our images and we adapted the grid that was created by an online tool when we created our own initial responsive grid. When we created our first responsive navigation prototype, we had been looking at other sites' navigations and tried to see whether they could work for us. And talk to other teams in your company to make sure that your problem hasn't already been solved by someone else within your company. We were able, for example, to take the grid that another team had created for the mobile phone and we used it in our small screen designs. Use everyone at once. This may sound counterproductive, but sometimes it's the fastest way to get things done. I think especially when you need to generate a lot of ideas quickly, getting everyone or even just a few people in a room and brainstorm something is the fastest way to do that, rather than just a single person in their corner trying to come up with some ideas over days or even weeks. And we did this when we needed to create the prototype of our responsive navigation that I've mentioned. And like I was saying before, I gathered some designers and some user experience people in a room, and we looked at what sites like the BBC or The Guardian, Google, what they were doing to get us started. And then we sketched with pen and paper how those solutions might work for us. And we talked and we had other ideas for maybe about two hours. And then we reached something that we were happy to hand over to be built. And it was, it was fun. It was a different thing from the rest of the work that we were doing. It, it was just a good break. But also don't use everyone at once. Other times the best way is to have one or two people move the project forward while everyone else is working on completely different things. This happened several times in our case, like when the developers were working on the document that we had created to add this initial responsiveness and the designers were working on something completely different. 
or when a developer was building the prototype of the responsive navigation so that later on designers could test and iterate again. And get people that are not involved in the project to pitch in. This might come in handy when you're in the midst of the project, like deep down, you have lots of stuff to do, and you need a pair of fresh eyes. And you might even forget that there's other people that you can ask things. And depending on how secret the project is, you can talk to people inside or outside of your company. But if there are people, anyone that is not directly involved with the project, they might come in handy at some point for things like, for instance, testing a device or testing a new pattern that you've created or giving you advice on something that you might not be familiar with, like sales or what type of content might appear on the site in the future. This is just something to keep in mind when you feel stuck or when you're feeling all alone. Quick and dirty UX. So let's take an example that I've already mentioned a few times. Ubuntu.com's navigation is tricky. It has several layers and it also has a big fat footer. But instead of one designer or one UX or both taking a few weeks to create a responsive solution, to do research, to do wireframes, to do mock-ups, a few of us just locked ourselves in a room for two hours, looked at other people's solutions, came up with some ideas, and based on that discussion, we sketched with pen and paper an idea that then a developer made into a prototype that we could improve on. Then we looked at the prototype, we tested it in a few devices to see how it felt to use, and we gave the developer a list with a few more things to try, and so on and so forth, until we got something that we were happy with for the first iteration. So, if you don't have time to follow a rigorous UX process, it's not the end of the world. I'm sure that you're capable and professional enough to understand how to get to a solution that works for your visitors and for your users without spending huge amounts of time on a very strict process. Experiment on smaller projects. This is a good way to test your code and the assumptions that you've been making along the way instead of just jumping straight into the big, scary main project. We tested our responsive typographic scale in a much smaller site than the main Ubuntu.com website. We also started using SVG images and modernizer on another small project. And because these were much less conspicuous than the main site, we weren't so nervous to try things out. And it was easier to then take a step back if something didn't work or if we had to fix any bugs or if we had to just try something else entirely. What would you improve if you only had one hour? It's good to get into this kind of thinking because this means you can't possibly have time to fix everything. And it makes you focus on the most important thing that you can do next to get you closer to having a responsive site or something else, whatever your goal is, this kind of thinking works equally well. You only, if you only have one hour, you will immediately forget about less important things because you want to get on with the stuff that not only matters, but that is also achievable in that very short time. And your project might as well have to be planned like this anyway for its entire duration so in very little bits of time. Determine breakpoints based on your users. The, there's not much more to say here. Before you read a thousand articles on how to determine breakpoints, obviously look at how your content flows, but also have a look at your data and see what numbers come up. We were surprised to see very large screen sizes just dominating the top 10 of our analytics. But in between those, we had uh, 360 pixels by 640 pixel size. And from time to time, we do this again, and we check the numbers again, just to make sure that we're still on the right track. Get rid of inline styles. Again, short and sweet. If you're going to have a responsive site rather than two different sites, 
inline styles are probably not gonna work. So you might want to go through your HTML and find inline styles and just take them out before they become a bigger problem. When we first applied a responsive style sheet to our markup, most of the issues that we had to fix were because we had used inline styles a little bit too loosely. Remove floats and remove positioning rules from your CSS and just see how the content flows in that linear manner and test this experiment in small screen devices. This is another thing that we tried and that you can try to see how much work you have in front of you. And you might even have a nice surprise when you do this. And again, this is something that only one or two people can do on their own for the rest of the team to test later on. Make an image inventory. Before you make any decisions on how to treat images in a responsive site that already has content, you should understand what you're dealing with. What types of images are used on your site? Who's creating them? How are they added to the site? In which locations? How the images play with the content? And are there different levels of importance, like user interface elements or decorative images, infographics, editorial images. Only after you've done this inventory, you will have enough information to decide what your site needs. In our case, we had five different types of images. We had pictograms, we had illustrations, which are a little bit more complex than just pictograms. We had photography, so lifestyle photography, photos of devices. We had also logos and we had background images. And each type was created differently and used differently. So after doing this inventory, it was only after doing this that we knew uh, what kind of solutions we needed to come up with for the different types. <clears throat> Compress bitmap images that don't need super high quality or transparency. A quick way of saving file size for us was to get the size of each section of the site through YSlow and PhantomJS and then pinpoint the super large images and resize them for performance. And some of them were really, really massively huge, completely unnecessarily. So that was a super quick and super simple way of reducing file size. Store reusable image assets in a central location. So another obvious way of saving file size and improving reusability was to make sure that the pictograms and the logos that we were using across the site were all coming from a central location. We created a pictogram and logo package with the different color variations that we needed. Our pictograms are always created in SVG format so they can be easily scaled to the size we need. And as a separate project, we also created an asset server that uses image magic to do things like auto-optimization or serving different image formats and sizes based on a simple query. Adjust type based on real devices. A, a super quick way of start looking at typography is to just scale down, literally scale down your typographic scale proportionately and then you can adjust. So you don't have to stay married to a rigid typographic scale. When you look at type on a phone, it's completely different than looking at type on your screen. Even if you're resizing the window on your screen, it's completely different. So by playing with sizes and, sp and spacing and testing it on devices, you'll know what feels comfortable. Don't keep two code bases for longer than you need to. You're gonna to have to release something at some point, even with lots of bugs and without improvements that in an ideal world you'd have time to work on. Maintaining two versions of your code can get unsustainable pretty quickly. So again, set a deadline for release and stick to it. You know it's not gonna be perfect or exactly what you wanted the first time, but at least you're not duplicating work for yourself, which is something that you simply can't afford to do. So don't aim for perfect, aim for good enough, because you can always improve on something that has shipped. 
keep a record of all decisions. People might be on holiday or sick or working from home that day and you want to make sure that decisions are not challenged all the time. It's good to have discussions, yes, but it's also good to not have to review decisions and go back on them when you don't have that time to spare. So in our case, we used Basecamp to document decisions. That meant that if someone wasn't there, they could still participate in the discussion and be updated on the progress of the project and also that everything was searchable. There are plenty of other tools that you can do this as well. And finally, talk and write about it. This is such an important part of going through a process like this. There are lots of people that are facing the same problems that you are. And just getting that glimpse of how other people deal with problems can be really useful. Even if the way that you deal with problems is exactly the same way as theirs, that can be useful because it's a way of validating that their way is not totally crazy and it's a way for them to see that they might actually be doing something right. That happens to me quite a lot. And sometimes it's the very simple things that you do in your projects that other people haven't thought of that can help them lots. So please share. You can read more about our work in our design blog and if you want to get in touch, if you want to know more about us or our projects, you can get in touch with the design team. Thank you. Thank you.